So um, if, we, if you're here at Central, Central is a metaphor for soil, all right? Don't blame the soil if you're not growing, but other people are, all right? We talked about what blame was. Blame, if you take the B off, is lame. So every time you blame something on somebody else, you become more lame each time. You cripple yourself because you're blaming other people uh, for, for the things that you're not getting done, all right? So today I want to deal with anchoring your fellowship. When I say fellowship, I, I really just mean uh, I'm talking about relationships, relationships one to another. Now, I was praying about this, and as I was getting ready for uh, this lesson, I realized that relationships are too important for me to address to try to fit it all in one series, in one 50-minute time span. So here's what I'm going to do, all right? This morning, I'm going to deal with relationships as far as uh, dating, um, dating relationships, romantic relationships. Then tonight, I'm going to deal with relationships one to another, all right? Uh, relationships as, as it pertains to your family, your friendships, uh, who to cut off, uh, who you squad up with makes a difference in your life. They either push you forward or pull you back. The things that you've been, been through in your life, okay, if you haven't heard me speak already, you know that I'm a realist, like real, real, really realist. I don't even know that's a real, I can't, okay, that makes no sense. But I'm a realist. So what does that mean? Okay, we're going to talk about how, if you were ever molested, how that affects your relationships. We're going to talk about how pornography, how it affects the intimacy in your relationships. We're going to talk about if you've been hurt or heartbroken, how that affects future relationships. So this morning, I'm really, I didn't come to, to, to play. I didn't come to mess around. I need you guys to lock in. If you're watching live stream, I need you to lock in. If there's anything I'm anointed to do, I'm anointed to speak on relationships. I've come from a broken home. I've been in enough bad romantic relationships. I've hurt a lot of people. A lot of people have hurt me. So I need you to trust me that the things that I'm speaking to you, the things that, I, that I've gone through, the things that I'm going to give you to help you, I've experienced myself. All right, so let's hop into it. There is a particular passage or a particular story in Genesis 29 that I want to use today. All right, there is there, there, there's a book, a great book by um, one of my my spiritual mentors. Called, uh, his name is Dr. Darius Daniels, um, and and he wrote a book called Relational Intelligence. And I want to read something, a quote from that book that I think is quintessential to where we're going the whole day. Today, this morning, and later tonight, all right? It says, God sends certain people into our lives in certain seasons for certain reasons. However, while God sends them, we must see them. God releases them, we must recognize them. God assigns them, we must align them. When something is this consequential, we must be incredibly intentional and intelligent about how we manage it. The way you manage your relationships is pivotal to your life. The way you manage your relationships is pivotal to your life. Why is that? Because the greatest joy and the greatest play and, the, and your greatest pain come from the same place, people. I'm going to say that again. The greatest joy in your life and the greatest pain that you'll experience will come from the same place people. So you have to be able to manage your relationships properly and put them in this proper place. Some people are not friends. They're just associates. Some people are you're not supposed to date. God assigned them to you to take them to another level through your own personal mentoring of them. So we're going to deal with that. But today I want to start out dealing with what it means to be in a relationship, dating, and deal with what I like to call, in, in, in this book that I wrote, I wrote a book called um, Home Again, and I talk about, in one of my chapters, called Approval Addiction. Approval Addiction, all right? Approval Addiction. So there's this story. There's this story. If you know anything about me, you know I am, I am, I'm into art, I'm into culture, I love, I love performing and fine arts. I do. I think it's, 
I, I, I mean, I just love everything about I love movies, I love TV shows, I love listening to music. Um, I love everything, everything about it, all right? So I love using stories because they paint pictures almost like movies, right? And the story that I'm about to use or talk or, or speak on in the Bible, it begins in Genesis 29. I encourage you to all read it. It's about the story of Jacob, Rachel, and Leah. Okay, many of you may have heard of this story. If you've been in church a little while, you know the story of Jacob, Rachel, and Leah. All right? Story has it that Jacob is on the run from his brother. All right? Jacob steals his brother's birthright. Mom sets him up real nice and says, hey, go live with uh, your Uncle Laban. Jacob goes to live with his Uncle Laban. Laban has two daughters. One daughter is named Rachel. The other daughter is named Leah. Okay? Jacob sees Rachel and is like, oh, yeah, I want that. Yeah. I got ha- to have that. So, so he goes to Laban and says, what I got to do to holler at Rachel? And here's, here's the interesting thing. You know, Moses had an interesting way of, of writing things in the Bible. Uh, he had an interesting way of saying certain things without saying certain things. I remember in the story of Abraham and Sarah when, as the Bible reads, it, it talks about how Sarah couldn't have kids because she was advanced in years. That's a really nice way of calling somebody old, all right? So he said she was advanced in years. So the way, the way he explains Leah is interesting to me because he said Rachel was beautiful and had a nice figure. Now, here's the thing. That's in the Bible. When the Bible call you fine, you bad. <laughs> Rachel was fine. But then <laughs> Moses, he says, but Leah had weak eyes. Okay, so Moses, what are you really trying to say there? Because if you say Rachel was fine, beautiful, had a nice figure, and Leah had weak eyes, I think that was a nice way of saying Leah wasn't Jacob's type, right? right I, I, can, you imagine, can you imagine that conversation in heaven, you know, and, and Moses walks into the room, and Leah sees us like, okay, Moses, let me holler at you. Weak eyes? Weak eyes. That's the best you can come up with was weak eyes. My sister, you, t- you, you talk great about, but weak eyes, that's the best you can come up with is weak eyes. So if I'm reading the Bible, it's, it's safe to say that Jacob wasn't attracted to Leah. Story goes, <laughs> Jacob goes to Laban and says, listen, what I got to do, what, what, what I got to do to holler at Rachel? And Laban said, okay, work for me for seven years, and you can have my daughter. Okay, let me stop there. Let me stop there. Here's a great principle. Ladies, peek in here. Okay. Jacob said, I'll work for seven years to get the woman I want. Principle number one, don't ever date a man who's not willing to put in the work for it. Yeah, don't ever date anybody who's not willing to put in the work for it. Conversely, conversely, don't ever, when he, if, he, if he's putting in the work, and don't worry, fellas, I got something for y'all too. Don't give it, I'm, not, I'm not jumping on y'all. Oh, we're going to deal with it today. We're going back and forth. It's kind of weird that y'all are two different sides, though, because it, it, it's going to get like that. Because I've sat in too many rooms. I've sat in too, in too many meetings with young people who don't know how to date. I was one of them. So don't ever date somebody who's not committed. In fact, make them finish something first. That goes for everybody. Make them finish something first. You know what? If you want me, show me you can be committed to a thing. Show me you can finish a degree. Show me you can get a job. 
Show me you can work a job and stay on it and be committed to that before you try to commit to me. Yeah, Jacob was committed. Jacob bought in. Jacob wanted Rachel. He was not wavering. He said, whatever I got to do, I'll do it. Story goes <laughs> that Laban, because in the custom, since Leah was older, Leah had to get married first. That's just the, that was the custom of the time, right? So Laban, and here's, here's an interesting fact. Here's an interesting thing. People always say Laban tricked Jacob. I'm sorry, I, 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 you, know, you know, this may be a little eisegesis, you know, um, but I think it's, it's, it's practical enough to, to, to say it. Okay, how does Jacob not know the custom of the time? If he knows Leah is the oldest, why did he not know that he will be put in a position to have to take Leah in the process? What point are you trying to make there, Lewis? Okay, you need to do your research before you date anybody. Because if you get into a relationship and say, well, I didn't know they were like that. Well, you didn't wait long enough through the process to see what their real true colors were. Sometimes you got to sit, sit back a while, fellas. Watch her in chapel. See if she worships or she falls asleep. I got one amen. Yeah. Watch her, watch her in her classroom. Do you ever see, do you, do, you see, do, you see her, do you see her getting after her? Do you see him getting after her, ladies? Or is he, he just getting by because he, he wants to make sure he's eligible to play his sport? Do your research. Okay, story goes. That Laban tricks Jacob, whatever, if that's what, if that's what you want to say. And then, guess what? Jacob was like, hold on, man. I wanted Rachel. I mean, Leah cool, but I'm not attracted to her. That's not, that's not who I love. That's not who I want. So here's what I'll do, Laban. I'll agree to another seven years. My goodness. Talk about committed. I'll agree to another seven years if I can get Rachel. Laban says, cool. Let's make it happen. Here's where the story gets dicey. Here's where the story gets very interesting. Because there is something that Rachel can do there's something that Leah could do that Rachel couldn't do, and that was have children. Yeah. Yeah. So Leah is thinking to herself, my husband doesn't love me. But guess what? I can have children, and Rachel can't. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to try to win his love over and get his approval by having his kids. She was like, God, you have heard me. You closed, Rachel. You heard me. You heard my sorrow. You heard my pain. You see, you hear. You see, you heard me. I can have kids. I, now, now I know. Now I know. Now I know Jacob's going to love me because I can have kids. Why is that important, Lewis? Because back then, if you can have a child, you were a respectable woman. Not only if you can have a child, but if you can have a boy because that would carry the lineage on. So the first child that Leah has, she names him Reuben. Some of y'all are like, okay, what does that mean? Reuben means to see. God, you saw my pain. You saw my misery. So maybe since you saw my pain, you saw my misery, I'll name him Reuben, and now Jacob will finally see me. 
Maybe, maybe all this work that I've been, I've been trying to do, and, and, and maybe I'm in this relationship and everything, and, and I've been, I've, been, I've been trying to get him to really notice me and give me the time that I want, and it just seems like he's putting everything else uh, above me, and, 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 I, and I'm, not, I, I'm not getting the attention that I want. But since now I can have your child, I'm going to name a rule. Maybe you'll see me. Jacob. Listen, I, that's cool and everything, but I still don't love you. I still don't see you. I love, I love the fact that you can have my son. Cool, but my heart, my heart is over here. That's what I wanted. Leah, she goes back and she's like, okay, okay, fine. I know what I'll do. I'll just have another child. I have another child, and of course, now, now I know he'll love me. She has another child, and she names him Simeon, which means to hear me. Now, maybe now, God, you heard me, so now maybe if I name him Simeon, right, right, he'll, Jacob will finally hear me. Yeah, fellas, like, oh, man, man, she's not, she's not getting me, man. I, I've been trying to tell her this is what I like, this is what I want. She's not, she, maybe, maybe, maybe if I do this for her, she'll hear me. She'll start, she'll start giving me the time that I want. She knows that I, I'm in love with her. I don't want to be with nobody else, but she's just not hearing me. She's not hearing my concerns. She's not hearing my needs. She's not hearing me. She's just, I, I don't know what it is. So maybe if I do this for her or do that for her, she'll finally hear me. How many Simeons are in the room? How many Simeons are watching? Well, you're trying to do everything. Maybe you're married. My spouse don't hear me. They don't see me. They so focused on their career. So focused on the kids. They're not hearing. They're not seeing me. So she says, you know what? Fine. Jacob, okay, you didn't, you didn't, you haven't been able to see me, you, you haven't been able to hear me, maybe, maybe, okay, if I have another son, wow, wow, maybe I have another son, you'll become attached to me. So she names her third son, Levi, which means to become attached. Guess what happened? Jake was like, I love the kids, but I'm sorry, Leah. I don't want you. Can you imagine the pain, the agony it is to continue to try to give all of yourself to somebody, and they don't see you, they don't hear you, and they still won't become attached to you like you want them to? Painful. Not only is it painful, it hurts because that has residual effects. So you take that hurt and that pain into another relationship. You take that hurt and that pain and you take it out on other things and other people. Because here's the thing. If it's one thing I learned as uh, in, my, in my psychology uh, background, if there's anything I learned from, from here in studying psychology and in studying adolescent development as a master is this. When your heart is broken, your head don't work. That's experience as well. When your heart is broken, the first thing that goes out of the window is your ability to rationalize. This is why when when somebody break up with somebody and they, and they, don't, they don't know how to handle that because they were so in love, they go slashing tires and breaking windows and stuff like that. Because when your heart is broke, your head don't work. This is why, fellas, when, when, when you decide, okay, I'm going to finally love a woman, you know, I'm going I'm to I'm finally love a woman, I'm going to be vulnerable, I'm going to give myself to her, and then maybe your heart gets broken, you're going to find revenge sex. You say, you know what? Cool. Okay, fine. My heart, you know what? Fine. I'll just go sleep with a bunch of women. 
Yeah, this is why, ladies, when you get your heart broke and there's someone who really wants to love you the right way, you make that new person pay for the mistakes of the last person. So you guard yourself. You build a wall up. And now that, that new individual becomes the collateral damage of something he didn't even cause. But here's the, here's the great thing about that story. I can't leave you there. Leah finally woke up. Leah finally said, okay, listen, Jacob, you're not going to see me. You're not going to hear me. You're not going to become attached to me. That's cool. That's cool in the game. Fine. All right? But I'm pregnant again. But here's the thing. I'm dedicating this baby to myself. And she names the baby Judah. Judah means praise. He said, I'm going to give God praise. No matter what happens, it's time for me to heal from the fact that you can't see me how I want you to see me. And the Bible is clear. It says she stopped having children. Because here's the thing. When you're fed up with something, when you finally get yourself together, when you finally realize you're worth something, you know what? Everything else doesn't matter. Everything else doesn't matter. When I say everything else doesn't matter, that means that, means that, that you've come to a place in your life that you refuse to be offended. You refuse to allow somebody to hurt you. In fact, even when you start dating again, even when you start, you start seeing stuff with 3D goggles. Because I, I call it 3D goggles because if, I, if I'm walking in, in, in the mall or something and I see a young lady, if, if I'm single, and I see a young lady or a young man that, that looks pleasing to the eye, most of the time you see things in 2D. 2D is height and width. 3D as depth. So you like, ooh, he look good. Ooh, she bad. But the moment they open their mouth, you're like, oh, you stupid. Okay, uh-uh. Mm-mm. No. I, I see past that. I see, I, see, I see past that. No, mm-mm. No, I'm done. Yeah, yeah. Or, or, or you get one of these. Hey, yo! Hey, hey, yo! Ladies, here's the thing. If, you, if a man ever does that, run quickly. He's about to ruin your life. That, hey, yo, don't, don't do that. Don't do that. <laughs> don't do that. I know us. Don't do that. All right? There's a way to do it. There's a way to do it. <laughs> so, so with that, with that, what am I saying? I'm saying there's healing that can take place. So when healing takes place, you can get anchored in your relationships and dating. All right? So how do you get anchored? I got four rules of dating. Four rules. All right? We're going to unpack them right now. The first rule is there must be physical attraction. See, some of y'all thought, oh, they must, the first rule got to be they must love Jesus. No. Mm -mm. There must, okay, some, I know some people watching, maybe, you know, some faculty or someone watching, it's like, Luke, why did you say that? No, they got to love Jesus. They got to be filled with the Holy Ghost. That has, okay, I'm sorry. I don't know anybody, fellas, y'all with me today, fellas, tell me. When you see a, a lady, a fine woman, somebody that's attracted to you, the first thing you don't say is, ooh, look at the Holy Ghost on her. <laughs> come, come on, come on. Ooh, I just see, ooh, yes, she's just so spiritual. Come on. Lady, when you see a when you see an attractive dude, you're like, oh yeah, I see it. Mm, he got an anointing. It's in his, it's in his abs, in his shoulders, in his legs. It's just all over. Come on. There must be physical attraction. That is the first rule of dating. Here's why, on a serious note, here's why that's important, particularly for us, fellas, because we we are motivated by sight. Yeah. I'm about to drop something on you. It's deep. It's real deep when it comes to searching and looking for a mate, for a girl. Get what you like. Ooh, that's so deep. Here's why. Because <laughs> if you like, <laughs> Lord help me. If you like what you like, all right, 
I'm, I'm trying to be practical and real, but at the same time being respectful, right? If you like what you like, get that. There, yes, I know there's times that where, where there's, there's, you know, they may not be the, your type of uh, physical type, whatever, but, um, uh, and, and, it's, and it's sometimes it's rare where, where they, you can still fall in love with them and, and, and things like that, all right? All right? But, but get what you like. Because here's the thing. If you, if you marry that person, right, and y'all having a bad week or a bad season or a bad month, I need to be able to know that I can still make love to you because I'm still physically attracted to you until things get better. Because if I'm not attracted to you and I marry you and things are going right, that's, that's, that's prime. That's prime for an enemy or the enemy, the devil, to send somebody that you like that has the physical attributes that you like and says the right things that you like and you end up doing something, busting the move that you shouldn't have bust. Or you end up looking, going, running to the computer and looking at stuff, expecting your wife to look like that when you could have got that in the beginning process. Ladies, if you like tall and dark, don't get short and light. Come on. Let's keep it 100. Okay, I said 100. Wow, I'm getting old. 100. Let's keep on it. Get what you like. That's the first rule of dating. There must be physical attraction. I have to be able to want to make love to you even when we ain't kicking it right now, even when we ain't, we ain't seeing eye to eye. All right? Rule number two. Oh, they must love Jesus. There we go. There it is. Rule number two is they must love Jesus. Now, I know people are at different points of their faith journey. I get that. And, and ladies, I'm going to talk to you for a minute because I've sat in these meetings before where <laughs> women was like, okay, okay, Lou, I, I, I love him, but he's not quite there yet. And I know, I really think he's just so cute and and he just has so much going for him. And you know what? He not, he's not quite there yet. He's still kind of rough around the edges. And, you know, he, you know, he's still trying to find his faith journey. But I can change him. Mm-mm. Mm-mm. Don't do that. Don't do that. I can, I can change him. I know, I know me. I, 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 I can change No, mm, don't do that. There was a statement that my spiritual, spiritual father in the gospel made that I, when I was younger, I was, sitting, I was at your age. And uh, I was in a relationship my senior year. He, he said something that was so, I thought it was, I thought it was so false. Until I actually got married. He said, what you get, what, you, what you're doing now in the relationship that you're in is going to double when you're married. So if you arguing like crazy now with a person that you're dating, and that does not change in the dating process, when you get married, y'all going to argue a lot more in the marriage process. Because now you can't just up and leave when you get mad. It don't work like that. And it becomes harder to figure out how to get over those humps when you're married when you should have done that during the dating process. And here's why it's important that they must love Jesus. I'm sorry. I want, if I'm going through something, okay, if I catch cancer today, heaven forbid, if I catch cancer today, I need to feel my wife laying hands on me when I'm sleeping, speaking in tongues, saying, God, heal his body, touch it. I, I need that. And only a person who loves Jesus, who is anchored in Christ, can do that for you. So rule number two, they must love Jesus. Must be physical attraction, they must love Jesus. When my babies get sick, when my babies get sick, I need, a, ladies, I need a man who can walk into the room, lay hands on his own children, and say, heal right now in the name of Jesus. That's what you want. You want power in your household. Rule number three. Y'all didn't like that one. 
Rule number three is talk it out. There must be physical attraction. They must love Jesus. Rule number three is talk it out. All right? Um, I don't know how y'all doing dating right now. You know, I, I was married by the time COVID hit. I don't know. Y'all doing Zoom dates or, or I don't know. <laughs> He was like, ooh, yes, we on a Zoom day. He showed me a little rose on the screen. He had the virtual background. It was so cute. Yeah. I, I don't know what y'all doing now. All right. So, 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 but I know one thing you can do is talk it out. Just talk it out. Yeah. Yeah. I um I think it's very important that not only do you talk it out, you talk about the right stuff. Yeah, I'm gonna park here just for a second. Let's go here. Um, can I ask you a question? <laughs> yeah, girl, you know that's me. All right. Um, how's your relationship with your mama? Do you, do you love your mama? Do you, do you have mama issues? Because I need to know that if I decide to do this, um, I'm not, I, I'm not trying, I'm not, I ain't got to be your mama and your girlfriend. I need you to be whole by yourself, brother. I can't be nurturing you and trying to figure out if I want to marry you at the same time. Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, that's cool. That's cool. That's cool. Yeah. I feel you. So, so, okay, can I ask you something? Yeah. Um, do you want kids? And if you do, how many? Because I need to know, I'm a family man. I've always wanted to be a family man. And the last thing I need is you going behind my back tying your tubes or doing stuff to keep me from giving me what I want. Oh, you probably think that's not, oh, that happens. That happens. Yeah, so I need to know now if, if you, if you, if you, if you are independent businesswoman, you worry about your career, you trying to excel in the corporate world, or you trying to do this family thing at the same time. Because if you do, you got to figure out balance. Okay. And I said that word. I, didn't want, I wasn't planning on going here, but the word came out, so I got to pause here and parenthetically assert that I don't believe in balance when it comes to um, things of life. I don't. Because when you say, well, I got to balance my life, that means everything in every season always has the same priority. And that's just not true. I believe that you shouldn't try to find balance. You should try to find a rhythm depending on the season that you're in. Find a rhythm that works for you. Because it's going to come a time if you have kids, or when your kids are grown, your kids are not really your priority anymore. Right? So you have to find a new rhythm based on the priorities of that season. That was just a little nugget for you, like you're in college, uh, and going to classes, playing sports and all that. And, you're, and, you're, and those who maybe say, I, don't know, I can't find the balance. I'm trying to do all, well. That's your problem. You're trying to find balance. Everything is not on the same playing field. Find a rhythm. Find a rhythm based on what's important right now. All right? All right. But back to talk it out. Okay? Um, how's, I mean, how's your relationship with, with your dad? Do you have daddy issues? Yeah. Do you, do you, have, do you have daddy issues? Um, because I, I need to know that. Right. Um, okay. How many people have you been with? Some of you say, well, that's not important. Okay. Well, it's a little extreme, but it's, it's been a, 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 listen, I was a youth and young adult pastor for about four years. Most of these stories are real. It was a situation where they didn't talk about this. Old buddy was dating a cheerleader, went to the football game, found out that his girlfriend, his new girlfriend, has slept with like half of the football team. Oh, do you think it matters now? <laughs> because if we get into this, I need to know who you've been with before we show up to the game. It's not, here, here's the thing. It's not a deal breaker. It's information. It's data. You need it. Yeah. Talk it out. You have to talk it out. Okay? How's your credit? <laughs> Some of y'all laugh. 
I don't know why y'all like something. Because <laughs> if you was younger and your parents put everything in your name, we got a problem. <laughs> How's your credit? How do you handle money? Do you budget? Do you like to travel? It, it, what, what are the things you like to do? Because me, I, I, maybe, I'm just, maybe you're just a homebody. You, you good with going to the movies every now and then. But, you know, you just like to kick it at home, save money. Um, your goals is that you want to have uh, a big house, a bunch of cars and all that. So you, you're more frugal uh, and tight with your finances. But you may, be want, you may be dating somebody or somebody that you're interested in who may want to travel around the world. So talk finances. Yeah. Talk it out. Let's, let's go a little deeper as we come into a closing time. Um, have you ever been sexually assaulted, molested? Because if we decide to do this and, and go the distance, I don't want to be making love to my wife or my, my husband, and the person you see is the person that you never heal from. That happens. Have you ever struggled with pornography? Because, listen, that is it's not a real picture of what lovemaking is. So you expected me to be freaky Susie and I don't want, and I can't do that. It affects relationships. If you don't talk it out, if you don't deal with it. And here, here is another thing that talking it out, another benefit from talking it out. Y'all ready? If I don't get anything else, peek in right now. Everybody, if you sleep, wake up. I want you to get this one point. All right? Here's what talking out does. The sooner we realize we're not supposed to be together, the sooner we stop wasting each other's time. The sooner we realize we're not supposed to be together, <laughs> the sooner you can go on your merry way, and I can go on mine, and you know what? God bless you. Because we sitting up in this, we playing games, and we going through the motion, we, we breaking up, getting back together, breaking up, getting back together, breaking up. We waste each other's time. Call a spade a spade. It is what it is. Game recognized game, my spirit, no spirit. Call it what it is. We waste each other's time. I'm tired of it. I love you. I think you're a good person, but you're not for me. Be man, be woman enough to say, okay, it's time for me to walk away. Stop playing. Because the greatest joy and the greatest pain come from the same place, people. And if you put people in their proper place, and sometimes that proper place is not in your life, you begin to move on with your life. Because if you don't manage your relationships, your relationships will manage you. And if your relationships manage you, you will mismanage your life. And the last one is, it's simple. I know some of y'all are going to hate this one. Don't touch. At all. Don't touch. And obviously when I say don't touch, I mean sexually. The emotional damage that I've done, I'm some, I don't know if some of you were here last, yesterday morning, and um, you may have been watching, you may not. Uh, I talked about how I had been through so many heartbreaks that I became a womanizer. And I would sleep around, and uh, women who were actually into me, who actually liked me, uh, I didn't like them like that. But I would use them to get what I needed, and then bounce, and then ghost them, what you guys call it today. And I was realized, and it took me a while to realize I was doing so much emotional damage to those individuals because I was, I was. I was penetrating an area of their life, a gift that God has given to them, and abusing it. I think the greatest 
one of the greatest things you can do in the dating process is love somebody so intimately, so deeply, in and out, and you never touch them until marriage. Because that means there's four levels to a relationship. Emotional, spiritual, intellectual, and physical. If the physical, this is, this is proven, proven research. If the physical comes before the other three, the other three never fully get there. If the physical comes before you, you emotionally attach to them, emotionally get, you know, understand their emotions and can trust them with secrets and thoughts until you can uh, know them in and out, how they think, uh, their mental capacity, if you're into them, if they, if they can hold a conversation and things like that. If you can, um, uh, 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 spiritually, spiritually, if you don't have a spiritual name, if you, can't, if you don't learn if they're, what, what their spiritual backdrop is, but you go straight to the physical, the other three never fully get there. If they do, it's extremely hard. Particularly for us fellas, because our nature is to conquer. This is why after we sleep with somebody, it's like, okay, what's next? You may love the individual, but it's still like, okay, we already, we already, we already hit the climax, the apex of what a relationship's supposed to be. So what's next? So as I close, if you're going to be anchored in your fellowship in regards to dating and relationships, I believe you have to do it properly. That is, um, you must be physically attracted to them. They must love Jesus. You guys have to talk it out. And don't touch. Don't touch. All right? Tonight... I'm, it's going to get a little heavier because I'm, I'm going to deal with uh, pain that comes from individuals you're supposed to trust. It's different when pain comes from a, a dating relationship or, you know, a boyfriend or girlfriend, somebody you met along the way in your life. It's another thing when the people closest to you hurt you. Family, brothers, sisters, uncles, friends, people that you grew up with. So we're going to talk through how to manage some of those relationships. All right? So let's pray. God, we thank you for another day. We thank you for who you are. I just pray right now that you begin to work in the minds and the hearts of these young people, God. If, they, if they're anticipating dating somebody, if they're into anybody, God, we ask that you begin to um, give them the right, give them the discernment to understand the necessary steps to take so they may have a healthy relationship, a healthy view of what, of what dating is, of what finding a spouse is, looking for a spouse is, God. And God, if anyone is dealing with approval addiction, where they're trying so hard for somebody to see them, to hear them, to become attached to them, I ask that you give them peace and the joy that surpasses all understanding. In your precious name, of our Lord and Savior Jesus, we thank you. Amen.